debate is Britain's borders, is it um, time to draw some red lines? And the debate, uh, the, the title of the topic was prompted very much by conversations, concerns, issues, um, and views that are being expressed by students about things that are going on in the news. And so um, that's where this title has come from. Um, we have two speakers. We have Keith Fraser, who couldn't join us for our hostings event um, last year, but who is able to come and um, talk about his position on immigration broadly, the refugee crisis, and perhaps make some comments on some of the more recent kind of um, announcements made by the Prime Minister this week. Um, and then, obviously, I think you're familiar with Diane Abbott, who um, uh, is our local MP. She was first black. British woman to be um, elected to Parliament and um, she has gone on to represent this constituency since 1987 and in the last general election she got, she put a majority by about 24,000 votes I think so she did exceptionally well at the last election. Um, I'm, we're going to have five minutes with Keith first of all, then Diane's going to follow for five minutes and then we're going to have a question and answer. So really, really get your questions, if you're thinking of something while they're speaking, write it down. We want the Q&A to be the main stay of the event. Okay, thank you. an important debate. So, Britain's borders, are they a breaking point? Well, are they? Who thinks that they are? No. How many of you? And let's see some hands to see if you think Britain's borders are a breaking point. Well, probably. Okay. Okay, well, that's fair enough. Okay, what is interesting, because if you, ask, if you ask pretty much the whole population, which issue is most important to them? They'll likely say, or certainly, you know, one of the big topics that they will talk about is immigration. Now, I myself, and as do you, kid, by the way, believe in positive immigration, where people come to this country to live, contribute positively to society. Immigration, as you know, is a necessary thing for all societies in order to move forward and to flourish. And where would this country be without immigration? But there is a balance. You know, what we've seen in the last 20 years is a huge increase in net migration to this country. Why? Well, that is largely down to our membership of the European Union. You know, one of the tenets, the central tenets of the European Union is freedom of movement. Which means that Britain's borders are open to 27 other countries within the European Union to which we are a member. 500 million people. That means they can come to this country to be, to live, to work, regardless of criminal record, regardless of job skills, or health record. That is actually a fact. Now, I'm sure you've all heard about the housing crisis in the UK, or our health service in short of funds, or that there's a lack of school places. Well, you guys are lucky you got a place, by the way. Uh, because many of you here, who I know study maths or economics, but will know that because open door policy, which we have, currently being a member of the European Union, 27 nations, we have no accurate idea, or estimate even, how many people are coming from one year to the next. Now I say you can't plan a wedding unless you know how many people are going to come. Can you? No. Yes. Someone said yes. Okay, well we can debate that. So I ask you, how can you plan for budget and budget for services when you simply do not know, and we don't, how many people we've got to cater for. You simply can't. And the government has claimed it wants to get net, net immigration down to tens of thousands, and it's failed. We know that, because it simply can't. And what has happened is we've kept many skilled people from places such as the Indian subcontinent from coming in, <coughs> because we can control that, and yet people from the EU, who perhaps are lower skilled, perhaps have a criminal record, get in over and above people from outside. It's crazy. You know, we need doctors in this country, and when I was growing up, we had a huge number of doctors from the Indian subcontinent. But now, 
Okay, we have to take preference over people perhaps with less skill, criminal record, etc. from inside the European Union. It's a crazy policy and one that will weigh heavily in the forthcoming referendum in the European Union. So when you queue, next time you queue for more than four hours in the A&E in a hospital, or need an operation, or you know children who are struggling to get into a school of their choice, part, one of the reasons, not the only reason, one of the reasons is due to uncontrolled immigration. Okay? Now last year we had a net migration figure of over 330,000, which is a 5% increase. And if our population continues to increase at such a rate, how can we expect quality services? Let's do a mathematical test here. If, let's say, I've got a hypothetical country of 1,000 people, and I've got a budget of £1,000, how much is that a spend per person? One pound. And if our population goes up to 2,000 people, and we've still got £1,000 to spend, how much is that per person? 50p. So, of course, migration has an effect on the quality of services and the amount that we spend, because you spread yourself thin. And then we have further problems in Europe in the form of the migrant crisis. Last year we had one and a half million people cross into Europe. We've got migrants trying to force their way into Calais, uh, in from Calais, I should say, at Dunkirk, while being housed in squalid camps, fleeing poverty and war from Africa and the Middle East, paying people smugglers to get to these shores and cross dangerous seas. You know, we are a wealthy country, and it goes without saying we have to help people. You know, we are human beings, after all. And what is the word human being, the word human being means? If you turn it around, it means being human. So that means we have a responsibility to be human. But as I've said earlier, there is a balance. And we have to help those who need our help. Whilst also not giving the message that we are a bottomless pit, because we are not, and we simply cannot do it alone. I mean, when you look at the people fleeing from Syria, into Europe. Why don't we question the fact that one and a half million refugees have found their way into Europe where cultures are different, political system is wholly different, our language is wholly different, and general outlook, outlook is different. While fellow countries in the Middle East, such as Saudi Arabia, Qatar, who have enormous wealth, enormous wealth, have not taken one person. We need to question that. You know, in the last year we've seen over one million migrants from Syria, Eritrea, Iraq, Iran, get to Germany, fleeing war, some fleeing poverty. But there are some who see Europe as an economic hub. You know, I've got a few more minutes, I'll be very quick. One minute. One minute. <laughs> okay, look, I thought I was told, uh, I, was yeah, told I had I know, 10 minutes. Yeah, sorry, yeah, you were in Okay, yeah, look, we know, look, we know that there are problems with the current migration uh, crisis. We have gender problems because 90%, you know, 65% of migrants coming to Europe from these countries are male. A considerable number of them are, are 18 and under and unaccompanied. So we have gender problems. You know, we know that, that male-dominated societies can create crime and sexual problems, as we saw in Cologne on New Year's Eve. So, I'm being hurried up here. You know, there is a debate on Europe, there is a debate on immigration, and we have problems with regard to culture, faith, and demographics. And if we, you know, what seemed like a humane idea is already proving a growing problem with a number of countries closing down their borders, building fences. To conclude, mass immigration does have to be controlled. We have to use balance. We cannot be a cure for all the world's troubles, or it could end up being the opposite. We have to find a balance. We need to cover, we can't just cover the wound, we've got to heal it. We can't answer it with a remedy, we have to answer it with a cure. We have to find stability in the countries where it's coming from. We have to deal with the people smugglers. We have, to, we have to ensure that wars are ended, poverty is ended, and we have to unite with all the Western powers and forget about power, money. We have to do it in the name of humanity. So let's be in control. Let's find the balance between being human and sensible, and, let's, and then once we are in control, then we can see how we can find the cure together. So we do have to draw some red lines. Thank you.
in Hackney, North and Stoke Newington, in the general election last May, we had the lowest UKIP vote in the country. <laughs> It's not because there's no bigotry in Hackney. It's not because we don't complain about each other. I've, I've heard West Indians complain about Africans, complain about Asians, complain about Turks. But actually, when it comes down to it, in Hackney, people know that immigration is not the root of all their problems. The second thing to say is this. I'm a politician, I've been the Member of Parliament for Hackney for 28 years and before that I was a city councillor. Politics is as much about language as anything else. And one of the things which makes this debate problematic is that as long as I have been alive, actually, immigrant and immigration in the British political discourse has been a euphemism for race and the other. Now, some of you will say, well, it can't be about race. It's all about Eastern European. I say to you, when you go home, Google Punch, which is the name of a magazine in the Victorian era, and Google the Irish. Every single thing that is said about white Eastern Europeans today was said about the Irish in the Victorian era. Everything that they come here, they undercut salaries, um, they're taking jobs away from Englishmen, everything. And actually, the anti-Irish racism in the Victorian era was highly racialized. And that's why I say to you, Google Irish and Google Punch, because the cartoons that you see in magazines of the Victorian era depicted the Irish as looking ape-like. So my argument is this, it is wholly dishonest and disingenuous to try and separate the debate around race and uh, around immigration apart from issues about race and about the other. So we have to be careful about the language. And, I, and I'm speaking to politicians in the Labour Party. We have people who look at you and say, oh, the Labour Party should be tougher on immigration. <laughs> And I say, well, yeah, but what, you know, how do you actually give people what they want on immigration? Because fundamentally, particularly when you come out of London, what you find is the, part, the, parts, of, the parts of the country where people are most upset about immigration are the parts of the country where immigration is most recent, and they've not had many immigrants. In the 2010 election, I've got a friend, he's the MP for Chorley in Lancashire, which is a marginal city in Lancashire and it's all white. So I ring him up because I want to know how the election is going. I said, Lindsay, how's the election in Chorley? He said, it's all right, he said. But they keep talking about immigration. He said, I tell them there are no immigrants in Chorley, but they don't listen. The fewer immigrants you have, the more anxious you are about immigration. And so the only way you will meet those people's anxieties is having less of people that look like me, that look like your teacher, that looks like most of you um, in the audience around. But actually, immigration, you know, what you're doing is you're building up an expectation that Britain can go back 50 years, which can't happen. The, come on, come on, come on. Alright, well let me, you know, there's a lot I can say, there's an awful lot I can say, and I hope you'll come out in the Q&A, but let me just say this final thing. I think there's dishonesty around the debate on immigration, because people won't acknowledge that what you're really doing is having a debate about race and identity and the other. There's a dishonesty because you're trying to pretend to people, people are frightened about what's happened to their society and their community, that somehow you can turn the clock back. But I'll tell you something else, if there's one thing that gets me upset, as a professional politician, I shouldn't allow myself to get upset, is when people talk about the burden that immigrants place on education, on health, and housing, and the public sector. And let me tell you, my mother was a nurse that came to this country in the 1950s, and without black people, Britain wouldn't have a health service. So I don't want to hear, without immigrants, you wouldn't have 
many of the public sector services that we see in Hackney. So I don't want to hear about the burden without hearing about the contribution that immigrants and the children of immigrants have made to building this country up and building <coughs> up our public services. It is a difficult issue. It is a very heated issue. It is a very emotional issue. And I don't pretend there isn't bigotry and there isn't suspicion and, and all the rest of it. But, you know, it's immigrants and immigration that made London, whether it's Irish immigrants, West Indian immigrants, African immigrants, Turkish immigrants, South Asian immigrants, all Syrian immigrants. It's immigrants that's made London one of the most vibrant and exciting cities in the world to live in. And whilst, as someone who literally deals with thousands of immigration cases every year, I'm anxious to get rid of some of the unfairnesses and the the incompetency of the immigration system. In the end, as the daughter of immigrants, I will stand up for the contribution immigrants have made to this society, and I will stand against the anti-immigrant bigotry that parties like UKIP seek to peddle. Thank you. said at the, last, at the last election we have to get immigration down. Why? Because <laughs> it is a genuinely worrying thing. Okay? We need immigration, but it needs to be controlled, not uncontrolled. Okay, so, uh, so to say that UKIP is against immigration is wholly incorrect. The other things you talk about race and so forth. Diane, I'm not, I don't need to remind you the amount of times you've said things about the white population, which have had not gone unnoticed, about white people wanting to divide and rule, etc., about black mothers uh, um, being better mothers, whatever they are, the, the, etc., whatever it was, I won't, I won't be disappointed. However, okay, let's go to the next year. If that is not a question of race, what is? So I don't think we should be hypocrites. Okay, when you, when, if you're complaining about so-called racist ideology, you've got to put up. Okay. You've got to put up. Now, the other thing is, with regard to Eastern Europeans, okay, no one's saying that we don't need people coming in. We do. But we have to look at the skills we need and then be in control of who comes in. It's very clear. Okay, Diane sent her child to an elitist public school costing £10,000 per annum. Okay? Now, with respect, with respect, with respect, Diane, when you... When you when your son was about to go to secondary school, you didn't apply to a school. You didn't apply. All right, maybe you did, but you sent him to an elitist school costing £10,000 per annum. At the end of the day, okay, what experience do you have about being on a waiting list, about overcrowded, overcrowded classrooms? You can't speak like that. And also, you've never been in the private sector. You've never been in business. The fact of the matter is, if you want to plan a business, you have to plan your turnover, you have to plan your expenses. And when we don't know how many are coming in, or who's coming in, we cannot plan.
that um, actually one of the rationale for immigration is that actually we're offering people opportunities to. So it's not necessarily that we pick and choose on in terms of what skills they're offering to us. Well, look, you, you know, you're absolutely right. But at the same time, you have to understand that while we have a policy being in the European Union where we have an open door, okay, you have a considerable number of unskilled people. Okay. Now, when you have what's happened over the last few years, you have unskilled people, let's say, doing a certain amount of hours a week, uh, work for low pay, and then they're able to come in and claim housing benefit, child benefit, etc. That is actually not really useful to our country. We need skills. We need doctors. When I was growing up, I used to go to a doctor. There was often a doctor from from India. Now, what we've done, we've stopped a number of people coming in from the Indian subcontinent because we have to let people from other jobs coming into the EU as part of our immigration policy. It doesn't make sense. Immigration is positive when it, of course, when it positively contributes to our society. And that's what we want. Okay. So, um, <laughs> this is an important point. One of the problems around the debates on immigration is there's a lot of muddle. The people that people broadly think of as immigrants, actually in some cases quite separate groups of people. On the one hand you have refugees, like the people that are coming from Syria, like the little boy we saw dying on a beach in Greece. And the point about refugees is we cannot choose which refugees we take. We have legal obligations under the European Convention on Human Rights, and I think it's wrong to muddle refugees who we have an absolute legal responsibility to, so long as they've, they've come here legally and so on, with other forms of migration, but that's probably the debate. Then you have economic migrants that come here to work. Now actually, the idea that we have an open door policy, I'm the MP of Hackney Infrastructure Minister, I've just come from Parliament, I have an office full of the immigration cases that I deal with. The idea that anybody from anywhere around the world can just walk into this country is a myth. It's a myth. I have people who've waited years and years to have family members join them. I've had people who've been turned out because they want a family member from a wedding or a christening. Actually, from the European when, Union, so bit. Let me complete. I didn't interrupt you. Um, it is a myth. People talk about an open door, but it's not an open door. A lot of my work. If any of you ever want to come and do an internship with me and come to my advice section, we, you, you'll see for yourselves that it's a myth that there's an open door. Of course, we're in the European Union and I have, you have free movement of labour. But the idea that European migrants, whatever people think or say, the idea that they just come here and sit down and claim benefit, all the evidence shows that European migrants, because they trend younger than the actual population, tend to take less out of the state because they're working and pull more in. One of the reasons that um, uh, uh, Mrs. Merkel in Germany wanted those Syrian migrants actually is because Germany has a declining population. Many of those Syrian migrants are highly skilled. And it actually, in many ways, it suits the Germans to have highly skilled population coming in. So, it, you know, this open door stuff, um, this idea that we can pick and choose, no. We have absolute obligations under international law. And just a word about my son. Yes, indeed, I set my son to the City of London. That was 15 years ago. None of you will remember what secondary schools were like in Hackney, particularly for black boys 15 years ago. If I had to send my son, and I applied to them all, actually. I also applied to some in Islington. But if I had to send my son to school today, I would happily send him to Stoke Newington, Mossbourne, and any of a range of secondary schools in Hackney. That's all. <laughs>
Okay, so I think it's in reference to um, a statement that you made last year where you said something along the lines that the British government shouldn't spend money trying to stop British potential jihadists going to Syria, they should actually pay for their flights to go there. So um, we'll come back to that. Um, and um, uh, one question here and then Neil will come to you in a second. Hi, um, I'm Mark. My question is, spoke with you, which may be direct to what you were saying that you pointed out that people often mix immigration for race. So if that's the case, then do you think it's fair, um, or do you stand by the notion that the hookup should be banned when you still have nuns and other religious um, following people who walk about in their religious attire that does cover, like, for example, the body parts, the heads, Okay, thank you. So three questions. Um, if you take so actually research suggests that there are more skilled people, the flights to Syria, or would you still pay for British jihadists to go and the car ban, where do you stand now? The car ban. Okay, so the first thing is um, about skilled people. Well there is evidence to suggest actually that a considerable number in excess of half of um, immigrants from Eastern Europe as a result of the European Union uh, are unskilled. Okay, so it depends on what statistics you look at. Um, again, your <laughs> statistics may be different to my statistics. There is considerable evidence to suggest that a considerable percentage are low skilled and actually do pick up in work benefits. Okay, with regard to the flights to Syria, um, it, it was a comment made partly tongue in cheek. I like a bit of a, a, a bit of fun and I think some man of mischief. Um, however, however, I will back it up because. In actual fact, the way I see it, if people want to go and live in Syria, or what we now call perhaps as Islamic State, let them go. You know what? This country, I am proud to be, I, I come from uh, uh, ancestral uh, immigrants, and I have to say, I'm not a Christian, but I am absolutely proud to live in this great country as a guest, Okay, given the freedoms that I have of religion, of worship, of speech, that you won't get in places like Syria. And if those people who don't like it, I say let them go. They'll soon find themselves over there and want to come back, as many do, because they realise that actually what we have here is something very special. And everyone should be grateful for it. Okay? Um, with regard to the... the, uh, the, uh, the uh, you're talking about the, uh, the full face cover. Okay, I know that in France they, they banned it. Look, we have a security situation in this country, and um, I think it's certainly, in certain respects, we need to ban it, in terms of uh, perhaps in certain areas, particularly banks, certain areas of high security, we have to. You know, what ne where needs must, we have to deal with it. I respect the fact that people have religious beliefs. I don't necessarily agree with those beliefs. And people won't necessarily agree with my beliefs. But I don't mind. If people want to practice a religion and it doesn't harm me, absolutely fine. Once it goes into the realms of harming others or wanting to harm others, or actually want to want to tell others what they should believe or what they should practice, I am against that. If you're peaceful and you want to wear if you want to wear a certain amount of certain clothing, that's fine. But in areas where actually it's not viable to do so then actually, I think it's wise to say, I'm sorry, you can't come in here uh, wearing that if you need to take it off. And if you don't want to go in there, that's fine. But sometimes we have to take the appropriate action and the approach, appropriate measures. Okay. Um, did you want to come back? <coughs> I think it's kind of a bit unsure question. It's about public spending. So you mentioned that you want to stop the public spending on the I think Keith was saying that, um, well, uh, I understand that it was kind of um, tongue-in-cheek. It wasn't a real policy, but it was the general sentiment. That yeah, it was tongue-in-cheek, but it was general sentiment. You know, like I've said, <laughs> this country is a great country, and I'm proud to be British. I'm proud of... It's not perfect. I know that many people hate Tony Blair. I know many people hate David Cameron. But, you know, we have the right to live in a country which has imperfections. And we have the right, like those countries like Syria and many places in the Middle East, they don't have the right to challenge those infrastructure. We do, and I'm proud of that. Um, 
Just on the question of the general sentiment, first of all, I would say that 99.9% of social dominants, when I say social we're talking about economic migrants, refugees, people like my son, who's actually a third generation British passport holder, but some people might see the street and say, oh, that's one of those immigrants people want to get rid of. 99.9% of immigrants are extremely proud to live in this country. Nobody could have been a prouder British person than my mother. I mean, so this idea that somehow, because you're an immigrant, that your loyalty to the country comes under suspicion, I would reject that. On the question of the general sentiment, yeah, I saw a story in the paper this morning about a 10-year-old boy in school and he wrote an essay, and in the essay, he said, he's 10 now, he said, I live in a terrorist house. So the police came to interview him. Actually, he couldn't spell, and what he meant to write was, I live in a terrorist house. <laughs> now, that general sentiment that Keith is talking about is leading to communities and individuals and children as young as 10 being harassed, and it's wrong. The Muslim community is not the enemy within. If we are concerned about ISIS, if we're concerned about international terrorism, we need to look at the background <laughs> to that. And I think it's widely acknowledged that some of the Western interventions in the Middle East have made the Middle East more dangerous than it, than it ever was. So the general sentiment, in my view, that in some sense is for people of Muslim background, maybe for people of black background, I don't know, to prove their loyalty to the country is one I reject because it's insulting and it's wrong. And as for the niqab, I do support people's rights, but it's a free country. You know, one of the things, one of the reasons I've had to finish is that all things being we are a free country. So people have the right to wear a niqab and they have the right to wear um, a, you know, the thing that you will find in some Jewish schools, the little halakha. So that, that's all part of your rights to the British person, it seems to me. Right. I, I do want to take some more questions, and then if perhaps we can incorporate something in, into the next set of um, questions. Okay, so I'm going to go to, to Neve, the young man there, and then Abdul Khan. Neve. Why are we not going after them rather than individual immigrants and their kind of contributions or 
lack of that we may have made against. Well, with regard to taxation, you're right. If people are not paying taxes, by the way, they're not doing anything illegal. It's just a loophole. And you know what? Every person that you know in the employment or in self-employment has an accountant. And the, the actual job of the accountant is to ensure that they are tax efficient, meaning they pay as little tax as possible, actually. That, that, that is a fact. When you employ an accountant, they ensure their job is to do your accounts, but also to see how they can save you money. That's, a, that's, that's just a fact. These, co these, these companies have found a loophole, they've done nothing illegal. If you want to close the loophole, it's down to the government to deal with it. Yes, you're right, and we need to deal with that. What were the other questions? Western powers. Okay, with regard, with regard to Western powers, okay, I'm not only talking about Western powers, actually, I'm talking about the big superpowers, like Russia, like China. You know, we have got a common enemy, and um, we have got common problems that we all need dealing with. Um, I personally believe that a lot of Russia's intervention in the Middle East is just a power, it's just a, it's, it is just a power struggle. And actually, you know, we need to put aside economic goals, power goals, to work together to defeat what is a global enemy. And that is um, an entity that wants the end of our free society. You know, when Diane says, oh, we've got to look at Western influence, that is absolute nonsense. And I'll tell you why it's nonsense, okay? We went into Iraq, into Iraq and Afghanistan after 9/11, okay, and yet people like people like her leader Jeremy Corbyn and, and, and Ken Levine don't like to talk about how um, people laid their lives in line because of Iraq. What about the people who flew planes into the World Trade Center on 9/11, killing 3,000 people? These were middle class, middle class, educated people, and it happened before our intervention into in Iraq, before our intervention in Afghanistan. We have what is known as a jihadist problem, and it is growing, and we need to deal with it. Okay? Okay. Um, Neve's point was about the land of use uses, isolating Muslim um, communities, isolating them. Well, UKIP doesn't use language isolating Muslim communities. I think you're a little bit mistaken. You probably think that UKIP, the, the, you know, the media and people like to put, oh, UKIP is racist. Actually, when you think about the European Union, it's a tad racist. Because what the European Union says is that people from 27 countries can come in regardless of criminal record, health record, job skills or whatever, but the people outside can't. So in a way that is a kind of racist ideology. Okay? What we are talking about is positive immigration. I'm telling you what you can do is what I am. There are a few idiots, but there are a few idiots in every party. We won't talk about the Labour Party. Okay? But there are a few idiots. No, there are. I'm not sure even I would say that there are a few loose cannons everywhere. Okay. The fact is, you can believe in positive information. Okay. And anyone who uses the wrong rhetoric, okay, we all make mistakes, but anyone who, who consistently uses the wrong rhetoric, you know, it, I agree with you, it doesn't help matters. Okay, Diane, if you, if you want to come back on that, but also need to question about Jeremy Corbyn, yeah. yeah. Well, on the Jeremy Corbyn, <coughs> no, Jeremy's not running away from immigration as an issue. And I can say this with confidence, because I've known Jeremy longer than all the other people in the audience have been allowed. He's not running away from aggression. The two issues really, the past few months, a big fight inside the Labour Party, um, trying to persuade our colleagues and Mr Cameron, obviously, not to vote to bomb Syria, because it was my view and Jeremy's view that bombing Syria will make everything worse. And so a lot of his time and energy and public statements have been about that. But the other thing to say is it's very hard for Jeremy to get what he really thinks out there. I mean, I've been a member of parliament, as I said, for 28 years. I think I've served under five leaders of the Labour Party. I have never seen a leader of the Labour Party have such a vitriolic onslaught in the media as they've done to Jeremy. And he's like, fine thing to get what he really thinks out there. But he's like me. He's represented a very diverse constituency. He's in some north, just, just across the road. Some of you may even come from his constituency. And he's very committed to fighting the narrative of immigration, which would have people believe that some are immigrants in some general sense, are the source of our problems. Okay, thank you. I think we're going to take the last round of questions now. So if you've got a question, stick your hand up now and just like, try and take them. Okay, so young man at the back, first of all. Yeah, what's your name? I'm Shay. Shay.
suggest a comment. Thank you very much. You didn't tell me your name. Layla, thanks, Layla. Um, um, question just above you, and then. saying 
if you have, if we've already discussed, if you've got a thousand people and you've got a thousand pounds to spend, you've got one pound per head. If you've got two thousand pound uh, people uh, a year later and the same budget, you've got fifty p per head. It go, it's just, it's just mathematics and economics. And so yes, you would, with regards to what you're saying, our services, our public services, are under threat. Okay, um, Shane, do you want to just come back on that, and then after I'm going to ask the closing remarks from both of our speakers, Shane, really quickly.
You know, it is, in, I mean, it's great that you've had this debate, you know, teach from that's what you always to debate, but it, it is regrettable that we're spending so much time um, debating the myths and bigotry around the issue of immigration when there are real issues facing people here in Hackney. There's the issue of housing. I was able to buy my first flight, I don't know if I was wearing keys, when I was 28. A lot of you will find it impossible, even on a good wage, to even actually pay rent in a shared flat in Hackney, let alone buy anything. There's a huge crisis of housing in Hackney, which means that people your age, even if they get on or get a decent job, and some of your teachers as well, my father's just having to move quite far out of London to be able to afford a house. There's a crisis in the health service, not caused by immigrants, but by Tory privatisation and Tories not funding it properly. There's a crisis about jobs, and there's a crisis you've seen internationally, the biggest refugee crisis since the Second World War. We have a legal obligation to those refugees, and we should help them. If there's only one thing I would say to you is one, don't believe the myths, because they are myths meant to whip up people's fears and just advantage. And secondly, there are so many important issues facing us, and it's important to debate those and understand those and push politicians, including myself, forward on those. And finally, absolutely finally, daughter of an immigrant, um, represent one of the pet parts of the country with the biggest immigration population per head, a uh, part of the country which immigrants have made and improved and enhanced and made so interesting and exciting to live in. And if I'm the last woman standing, making the case, the positive case of immigration and fighting the myths of immigration, I will be the last woman standing. And you have my promise on that.